Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of A BJJ, BJJ Marriage. Marriage, where we talk about our lives as a married jujitsu couple. What doing? <laughs> Hello. What doing? <laughs> Ellie, I hate you for showing us that video because seriously, all day we've just been saying, What doing? What doing? And then even with Scarlett on the bed, I went up to her and was like, Mwah! And Scarlett just freaked out. She was like, What's <laughs> happening right now? And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you should go look up Hamlet the Bird because it was so funny. <laughs> I have definitely seen Hamlet the Bird before. Have you? But I didn't know that you knew Hamlet the Bird. But now. <laughs> I did not know. Now it works. I did not know. Because if before you were doing something and I looked at you and said, what doing? You'd be like, the fuck is wrong with you, Nick? (laughs) (laughs) What doing? Welcome to episode 63 of A BJJ Marriage. Three of A BJJ Marriage. All right. Very cool. Uh. So thanks for listening in. (laughs) <laughs> have a great day <laughs> no i was just gonna say like 63 episodes is a super fun accomplishment that we've managed to pass <laughs> oh my goodness talking uh-huh. is gonna be hard today uh-huh. but no so anyone who has been like sticking with us through episode one we appreciate you anyone who's just listening to this for the first time or maybe other episodes we also appreciate like you. like michael Rang, who has listened to every episode i don't know why you keep bringing this up because I didn't mean it like that, and you just so keep funny. bringing it up. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But we had a freaking awesome week here. Yeah. Over in the BJJ Marriage household. Yes. It's been a fun, fun week. <laughs> yes. So let's talk about, well, I think the beginning of the week was less jujitsu for you. Was it? Tuesday and Wednesday. I mean, I still rolled on Tuesday. A little bit, yeah. But, uh, <clears throat> what did I do on Tuesday? I don't remember Tuesday. I don't really remember Tuesday either. <laughs> Tuesday did not happen, I think. Well, I got a new job. Yeah. So, it's been kind of a whirlwind of a week for me because I was going through my transition. I ended up switching over to a different financial firm than what I was at. I'm still doing the same thing, but at a much bigger company now. So, I'm very excited. But, that's been kind of exhausting, going through the transition. Mm-hmm. So I took Wednesday off to lay in bed. <laughs> she took Wednesday off to duck one of our training partners. Yeah, Justin, I didn't want any of your smoke, apparently. <laughs> yep. Uh, but yeah, so uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, I think, were all just like normal training days for us. So it was Friday, I guess. It was yep. kind of a normal week. But anyway, let's get to the fun stuff. So yesterday, we had pancreation. It was the fourth pancreation event that Primal has put on, and these are just phenomenal events. If you're from the Milwaukee area and you enjoy watching MMA, even if you're not competing or your school is not competing, Primal puts on a fantastic event every single time, and every time they're getting better at it, it just is becoming more of a almost professional-looking scene, Mm -hmm. and it's, it's very fun. We love going. And we actually had two of our kids compete again yesterday in it, which was super fun. Yes, we had Marco Panic. And Alex, the animal Ibertowski, mm-hmm. fighting yesterday. Mm-hmm. They're little <laughs> monsters at the gym. Yes. And we've been uh, training them a lot. We've been doing lots of sessions together mm-hmm. and um, specifically doing drills and stuff to help them get ready for pancreation. If you're unaware of what pancreation is, it's MMA with no head strikes. Mm-hmm. And it's really cool that we've got that going on here in the Milwaukee, West Dallas area mm-hmm. because it's such a great entryway to figure out. If you're even interested in striking and grappling at the same time. Yeah. And as the commentators are saying, it's so much safer because you can still do MMA, but without the head trauma. <laughs> yes. Because, <laughs> you know, our, our kids need their, their brains. Yes. But, yeah, so we've been getting our kids ready. So some of you may know, some of you may not. We actually, Nick and I, teach the kids MMA kickboxing class on Fridays at yep. 5 o'clock at Fluid. So if you're listening to this and you have a kid and they're not involved, you should get them involved. Yes, get them to come beat me up. Yeah, it's a fantastic program. Uh, it's growing all the time. We're constantly showing in new combos. So we're very active in our Muay Thai classes. Mm-hmm. We have Muay Thai twice a week. And so we kind of just take what we've learned throughout the week and bring it into our classes, but at a dumber down version. I've been doing Muay Thai for at least three years now, I think. Yeah, I've been That's, doing it for two. It's kind of crazy. So, 
yeah, we've got a lot going on at Fluid, and it's always fun. But the kids striking class is just, I feel like it's so different because I don't feel like a lot of kids get to, like, do striking. Because we let them spar. We let them, like, actually go at each other just without the head strikes. Like, it's basically pancreation, but in training. Yeah. And the kids love it. Like, every time that we don't get to let them spar, because maybe we're doing a drill for too long, or maybe we want to play a game or do something different, like, they actually get sad. They're like, oh, I wanted to spar today. Yeah. So there's been, like, two or three different times that we actually just let them spar the entire 45 minutes. Because <laughs> we're like, just get all your energy out from the week. Mm -hmm. Like, I have a feeling in June we'll probably do it on a Friday where they can just spar the whole time because school will be out and they're going to have all this energy and be so excited and be like, just go kill each other, but not literally. <laughs> it's going to be 90 degrees and be like, all yeah. right, go for it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, we do that on Fridays and our kids who competed yesterday are there almost every week for it. It's Marco, Alex, Lewis was supposed to compete as well, but he so ended up signing late. up too late so he didn't get a match, but that's okay. But we were at, well, actually, we had something before pancreation yesterday. But, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's right. <laughs> we totally on, did. We're on a high right now of, like, but, everything that happened yesterday. Yeah, but I wanted to talk about pancreation and then talk about leg locks in general. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. But, <laughs> back to pancreation. There was a lot of good fights mm -hmm. leading up to it, and there was a lot of fun stuff going on. But I think when our kids took the stage, it really started amping up the crowd. Because... Mm -hmm. The way that they fought was so fierce and so much heart. had so much technical elements in it. It wasn't just like kids running up to each other like rock'em, sock'em, boppers. <laughs> is that how that was, that was called? Ro Roboblox? No. Roblox. Rock'em, sock'em. Robots, not boppers. Yeah. yeah. Like those little green and blue things that are in a little like wrestling ring and you have to press the button a million times so yes. that they just punch each other. So there's a lot of time in kickboxing class that that's what the kids do. Yeah. And I'm just waiting for one of their heads to pop off. <laughs> yeah. But Marco and Alex, like, they could probably beat me up if they really wanted to. Like, they've got good technique. Mm -hmm. They've got good stand-up game. They've got good ground game. Marco can improve a bit more than Alex can. but well, Marco hasn't been doing jiu-jitsu that long. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But still, for what he has done, he's got good ground game. He was able to get on a mount in his fight yesterday. Nice. You remember that? Yep. Yeah. Which, that's hard. Yeah. <laughs> Hard yeah. in general. He was able to get out of mount in a second round of a three round fight with his gloves on. So it was just, it was impressive on all parts, especially because Marco is either a four stripe white belt, which in kid terms is like basically a zero or one stripe white belt compared to an adult. And then he's also, he may have just gotten his gray belt actually, but even still. Like I think he tested on Monday. I didn't actually hear any results about the gray belt. Okay. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so either way uh marco just doesn't have very much jujitsu experience under his belt quite yet he's been getting much better he's fantastic on the ground for where he should be uh but yeah he went against an opponent who i think is a yellow belt or even higher yeah so that was pretty good for him to get out of a mount of a yellow belt which was super cool yeah leo's a beast he's uh marco's opponent was leo Soria. 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 yep and uh he trained at Fluid for a little bit. Mm -hmm. He's like a child friend mm -hmm. of our Fluid kids. Yep. And this is the second time Marco and Leo had a fight. Yep. And the first time Marco and Leo had a fight, Marco won by split decision. Split decision. And again, throughout this fight, Marco ended up taking a split decision win. Mm -hmm. I think Marco won the first round. Leo won the second round. Yep. And then Marco just edged out the, the third round yep. for a super close split decision. And I think it just came down to the aggression levels that were coming out of both of them. Because by the third round of any fight, obviously you're exhausted, you're tired, you don't want to like keep moving as much as you were in the first round. And I think Marco just had a little bit more energy and a little yes. bit more oomph in his punches yeah, like, than Leo Yeah, he did. was still coming forward mm -hmm. and Leo was like backing up. So you can see like you're breaking a fighter yeah. when that's happening. But, I mean, Leo did fantastic. Like I said, it was a split decision, so it wasn't like it was a domination or anything. Leo did phenomenal. We still love him. We still support him. We still train him when we can. Like, yeah. It's, it's, I, I coach him at grappling tournaments. Yep. Um, it seems like whenever he goes to compete, it's just his parents there. Mm -hmm. So when I, if I don't have anybody to coach, I do coach them, mm -hmm. and they, they're good kids. I keep telling Leo, because this is now the second time that Leo has fought Marco, and as much as I love Leo, because Leo's kind of like an OG or fluid, uh, 
Marco is my fluid, so I have to support Marco, and I have to yes. coach Marco, and I have to corner Marco, but I hate that I have to root against Leo. Like, it makes me so sad. Yeah, because they're such great kids. Yeah. Like, I love both of Like, it's Leo and Mateo, his brother, too. His brother doesn't do pancreation. His brother just does jiu-jitsu. But Leo, yeah, we love you, bud. You did a fantastic job. <laughs> Absolutely. So, yeah, then after Marco got his win, which was fantastic, you should see his face, by the way. It yes. was the cutest thing. It probably made my entire day when he I'm found gonna out I'm going to post a won. video of that later. Because okay. it took a video of him getting his hand raised. Yeah. And his face was just, yeah! yeah, he was very happy, very proud. We could not have been more proud as coaches for him, too. Yes. But then a couple of rounds later, maybe only like three fights later, it was our Alex. next competitor, Alex. The animal. The animal, Ibertowski. He really is an animal, guys. Like, if you... If you do not, uh... like, put a leash on him, he is everywhere. Just like me. <laughs> <laughs> if you have not ever had the pleasure of rolling or striking with little 12 year old Alex, you should try to do so because he is fierce, man. Like he will do whatever he can to show you that he will win. And I love it. I love the animal and the aggression that comes out in him because he doesn't really get to showcase it very much mm -hmm. in class because he's 12, but he's a little smaller for being 12 years old, but that's that's not the point. Like he's fierce, he's strong. A whole he's 75 great. pounds. Yeah. He's um he's got fantastic technique like we said, which we'll get into in a minute, but in class like pretty much everyone besides Marco and Lewis is like less technique and less skill than him. Mm -hmm. And so he doesn't really get to take out that power and that aggression on anyone in live sparring. Yes, because we like, always have to tell him to tone it down. Yep, because he wants to throw those powerful kicks and those powerful jabs, but he can't do it to someone who doesn't know how to defend them. But yeah. in the ring, we told him right before he went on, we're like, hey, you can go hard. We're not going to tell you to calm down today. And he's just yep. like, okay. He was very excited. And man, did he show it. Right when the fight started, the ref was like, fight? And mm -mm. halfway... not Yeah, not even before he said right. fight. <laughs> halfway before his hand came down and he said fight, Alex was already halfway across the cage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was like, Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Like, you know when you pull a car back and it's got that little wheel that retracts, retracts, and you let it go and it's like, Woo! <laughs> That was Alex. That was Alex in the fight. Yeah, he literally, like, he was ready to go and he did. He went at him, he punched and kicked him as hard as he could multiple times. Like, yes. It was wild. And then they got up against the cage and they circled a bit with each other. They both mm -hmm. kind of got in the headlock. Mm -hmm. And then Reed, his opponent, which this is the third time he's fought Reed. The yes, first time the they trilogy. fought. Yeah. Imagine being 12 year old and having a trilogy fight with somebody. <laughs> Marco and Leo. Uh, probably no. not. Because Marco just won twice. Yeah, we'll see. But. Um, but yeah, so Reed and Alex were. So the first fight, Alex got guillotined. Second fight, Alex won by decision. Um, I don't remember. I think Alex won by decision. I think he won. But anyway, it doesn't yeah. matter. Alex won the second one. Yep. And Reed then, won the first one. Yeah, so this was the trilogy. So they got up against the cage. They were circling. Um, they both kind of got like a headlock type deal. Reed ended up taking him down to the ground and ended up on his back with hooks with like a 90% full rear naked choke in. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and all of us were just like, <gasps> and like, oh, like the, us in the corner, we were with Coach Thaddeus and the three of us were just like, elbow, hips, get rid of this, move. Like we were just like freaking out because we yes. wanted to make sure that he could get out of that rear naked. Yeah, we were giving him all the energy we could give him from the corner. But that was a tight rear naked. And you could see it. And he was squeezing and Alex was changing colors. Mm hmm. If you heard us talk about choke theory, mm -hmm. he was he was like a strawberry almost into a blueberry. Yep, yep. He was almost there. We were we were nail biting over there. Like it was yes. nerve wracking. We thought he was gonna tap. I was actually like this close to tapping for him because it was it looked bad. Yes, but he made one slight adjustment where his hips came out of the hooks just a little bit, and he could start turning into him. Mm -hmm. And then I screamed with everything, "Turn into him!" And he did. He turned into him, and then it was like a, a halfway rear naked choke. And then Alex reversed the position, ended up in close guard, and just started wailing on him. Yep. And you could see Reed was like, oh, no. Yep. And then by that point, Reed is just defeated because now his whole arms are all just burnt out from holding yeah, him he naked for 20 seconds. He was squeezing. He was tired. He was done. But yeah, Alex just went and went and went. And you have no... I almost cried. Like, I was so excited when he got out of that rear naked choke because while we were warming him up in the corner... 
I literally, I remember rolling with Alex once and he got me into a rear naked choke and he's 75 pounds. So he's got these scrawny little (laughs) arms. And when he can get those arms around your neck, like it gets really tight, really, really fast. And I actually thought about that while we were warming up because I was like, you know, he's going against someone else who's the same size as him with scrawny little arms. So maybe we should go over rear naked chokes. Like what's he going to do if he gets in a tight little choke like that? So we literally went over a rear naked choke 10 minutes before he went into the ring and how to get out of it. And then he got into a rear naked choke and he got out of it and I freaked out. I was just like, oh my God, we just did this. We just got out of this. I was so excited. I like seriously almost cried. What a coach's moment for you, hey? <laughs> yeah, it was fantastic. Yes. But, that is amazing. So yeah, then the third, it was the second round now. Well, at the end of the first round, after he reversed the position, he just dominated in side control mount for the rest of the fight, Mm -hmm. the rest of the round. Oh, yeah, and then he tried to go for a head and arm. Yep, and then he got a head and arm, and then Reed was going to tap, but then the buzzer went off Mm -hmm. before he tapped. His hand went up to tap. If Alex had five more seconds, he would have won. If he had two more seconds, he would have tapped him out in the first round. Yeah. So then the second round comes, and of course, Alex is in there with the bundle of energy that he has again. And it's just a, a crazy good fight, great exchanges, and then Alex got into the ground. No, I think Reed went to the ground. I don't remember how they got to the ground, but... um, Yeah, they circled up against the cage again. And then I think, yeah, Alex took him down. And Reed ended up in his guard. And Alex was trying to pass the guard with him crunched up against the fence. Mm-hmm. And then they were almost in like a 50-50 position. Yeah, they were in mount. Of. They went to a quarter guard. Yeah. And then Reed ended up getting up. Yeah. And then Reed took down Alex. And Alex was in his guard for a split second. Mm-hmm. And then, little Alex, 75-pound, 12-year-old Alex, um, scoops up Reed's leg in, like, a single leg X. But So he's got his leg over his hip, but his leg is also over his shoulder, and he pulls his arm at the same time. He pulls his arm straight. So imagine, like, an omoplata, but with the person's leg in it also. And then he pulls the arm, and he does a straight arm lock, with a single leg X and an omoplata hold. Mm-hmm. And the announcers called it a Cayman arm bar. So apparently somebody has seen that before. <laughs> and called it something. Yeah. But that well, was Marco phenomenal also, to see. Marco also got out of a, an arm bar, like a really tight arm bar. A mounted a arm bar. Yeah, with a hitchhiker escape. And the commentators actually were like, he just had a hitchhiker escape. He's dead. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was great technical escape by Marco. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, Alex did that. And everyone was like, it was kind of bundled up. You couldn't really see. And, like, I think we've talked about this of why jiu-jitsu is not in the Olympics because there's so much that happens that you can't see what happens, all that invisible jiu-jitsu. Jiu-jitsu is not a spectator sport. Yeah. Let's just be honest. Yeah. So that's, like, <laughs> p- pretty much the only people that could see what was happening was us in our corner because they were in the corner yep. that we happened to be in, and we could see what was happening because they were facing us. So what was happening was he, like, looked like he was almost going for an omoplata or a heel hook. It looked like he had a single leg X and he was doing a heel hook. Yeah. Like, and we're just like, like, honestly. like all of us were like, you can't do that. You can't do that. <laughs> that like, is not in the rule set. They were like, you're 12. <laughs> and when the ref stopped the fight for a split second, I was like, did he just get disqualified for a heel hooking this child? <laughs> <laughs> but what was happening was, so it was like Thaddeus and then Nick and then me and then it was the scorekeeper. So it was the four of us in a row and the only people who could really see it was the scorekeeper and me because we were in direct view of it. And I had saw I, I saw that Alex took the arm underneath and like did a really crazy arm bar. It was crazy. And Reed was tapping and the ref didn't see it and I had to actually say like tap, tap, tap because no one could see it except for the scorekeeper and I. And then the ref was like, oh my god, stop! And like, literally, I looked at the scorekeeper, and he was just like, that was super cool, and that was not traditional, and that was insane, and he is a monster. And I was like, he's my monster. And then, like, as he was getting his hand raised, I was like, that's my kid. He's not really my kid, but that's my kid. I was super stoked. <laughs> yeah, you didn't come in the cage at all yesterday. I didn't. I wanted to watch Thaddeus to experience it. Yeah, I know, but you didn't come in at all, right? Mm-mm. Yeah. Nope. So I stayed on the side. I figured Alex didn't need three corners in there with him. But you can, like... Shake hands with the kid and um, the other coaches. I did as they walked out. Oh, okay. I yeah. met him at the at the gate when they were walking out. Mm-hmm. I just like going in the cage. I know. <laughs> I know. But yeah, so it was just a super cool event. So both of our kids went and they won, and it was a two for two day for fluid, and it was a very 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 fun experience. Yeah. So they did fantastic, and they they were so happy, and then we treated them to a little party at our house. Mm-hmm. And we yeah. had Chinese food. 
Yep. I asked Marco because he was there first. And I was like, Marco, you won today. This is your celebratory dinner. What do you want for dinner? You just can't get steak because there's a lot of us. And he was just like, Chinese food. I was like, okay, that's that's reasonable. We can do Chinese for 15 of us. That's cool. And I was like, what do you want? And he's like, I don't know. I've never had it. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, what do you Did mean? Did say you- that because I'm Chinese? <laughs> I don't know what he said. Why would he pick Chinese food if he's never had I it? I don't know. He just wanted to try it. So Jeez. we ordered a ridiculous amount of Chinese food. It was fantastic. It was a great night. But anyway, yes. so we we're just still on a really big high from that from yesterday because it was super. We actually yeah, we're had, super proud of them. We stopped at a housewarming party in between that, so right after pancreation and right before dinner, like we stopped at one of my best friend's house because she was having a housewarming party, and one of our friends was there, and he was just like, "Wow, Brittany, you have like a lot of adrenaline right now." Or what did yeah. he say? I think he was, he said yeah. adrenaline, and I was just like, "You have no idea what just happened. You have no idea what I just left. I was so <laughs> excited. I was just, I was. We were beaming. I was freaking out how excited I was. Uh-huh. So, but yeah, um, kind of what we wanted to talk about today. <laughs> the real topic. Yeah. Twenty uh, minutes later, we wanted to talk about some leg locks mm-hmm. today. So, we started yesterday before pancreation with a two-hour nogi leg lock seminar with Joey. The real, real deal. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Joey Deal. Yes. He's a um, two degree, second degree black belt under Jeff Kern mm-hmm. that has a school in Illinois mm-hmm. and uh, also a professional Bellator MMA fighter. Yes. He was supposed to be on today's episode, but we decided we did not want to wake up at 5 a.m. to do it. So we're yeah. actually going to see him again in about an hour. Yes, because he's got another seminar today about movement or mobility mm-hmm. for jiu-jitsu. Mm-hmm. And he already taught me how to do, like, way better handstands. So if you thought I was good at handstands before, you just wait, because I've just upped my game. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, so we started that out yesterday, going to Fluid for our two-hour seminar with Joey. Yes. And it was all about leg locks. Mm-hmm. And kind of leading up to it, I, I mean, I wasn't, like, super, super excited. I'm not a big leg lock person. And I know that as a newer blue belt, like, it's not really in people's games as a newer jiu-jitsu practitioner to do leg locks. Right. And so I've always kind of just, like, known they were there, and I've more so cared about the defense to them more than I ever tried to do them. And I I even was deciding yesterday, I was like, oh, you know what, like, I don't ever actually set up a leg lock. If I go for a straight ankle or if I go for a heel hook, it's normally because it's in front of me, not because I set it up. Mm-hmm. And, like, leg locks are just not something that I'm passionate about. And it's not that they're not important. They're just not, they were never something that I cared to really learn. Yes. Until. But why would you ignore 50% of the body? (laughs) So here's the thing with leg locks. And I think last episode I brought up leg locks for dummies, Mm -hmm. the video. Mm -hmm. And I posted that in our uh, group too. Mm -hmm. But that's a good representation of an intro of how to start thinking about leg locks is. And Joey put it in a great um, analogy. He was saying how when you learn side control, side control is a very broad term because there's so many different ways that you can hold side control. Mm -hmm. Like you can hold your arm under the head. You can hold the arm over the head. Hip side arm can be over the hips. It could be on your side doing like a doorstop type deal. You can can lean in scarf. You can do reverse scarf. Uh But that's all still considered side control. And it's the same thing if you think about the positional differences in leg entanglements. The only thing that's like extra complicated with leg entanglements is every gym and every school and everybody on the internet has a different name for all the different leg entanglements. Yeah, you got all like the Japanese names, like Ashigarami. Ashigarami, which literally means leg entanglement. Yeah. I don't know if you knew that. I did. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um. But there's different orientations of leg entanglements, and they all have different pros and cons. Mm -hmm. And Leg Lots for Dummies really does a good job at explaining that in three eight-minute videos. Uh But the seminar we did with Joey Deal, it started out, the first hour of it was us drilling all the different leg entanglements, leg positions, and a a flow type of drill. So that you and your partner can get through the positions. Mm -hmm. So like, let's go back to side control. If you were learning jujitsu and you didn't know much about side control and somebody said, you got to do this Americana, but make sure you're in side control when you do it. It's going to be very hard for you to finish Americana 
if you don't know how to hold the side control properly. Because most people, I mean, think about when you were first starting or maybe you are brand new and you were learning an Americana from side control. A lot of you probably went all the way forward with your body and you kind of picked up your hips so that you were almost in like a yoga pose in a way. And then you were just cranking on an arm. The like, Americana is not what we're talking about. Right. but And then you get just rolled over and you lose everything. Yep. And now you got to defend again. It's basically a forward roll that they do to you when they oopa into you and get you off of their arm. Yes. It's the same thing. Or it's not the same thing. But that's how leg locks are treated. Mm-hmm. When you think of leg locks, you think of heel hook and you think of a, a submission. Mm-hmm. But you're never going to successfully finish a heel hook on anybody that's experienced in leg locks without understanding the position. And how to hold it and then finish the submission. Mm -hmm. Just like many people talk about in Jiu-Jitsu, position over submission. Yep. And leg entanglements just have a whole bunch of positions that you need to first understand. And like I said, understand the plus, the pros and cons of each leg entanglement. Mm -hmm. So for every leg entanglement, which we'll briefly mention, but there's a different level of heel exposure. For your being submitted or submitting somebody, there's a different, and Joey didn't bring it up yesterday, but there's a different aspect of back exposure for all these different types of leg entanglements because one of the main ways to defend a leg entanglement is to take their back or he'll hook them back. <laughs> um, there's different elements of control and um, different elements of like the danger of the heel hook. So, like inside heel hook is much more, is going to finish much faster than an outside heel hook is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if you can think of like, how do I explain this? So if you ever have been to a science museum, you've probably seen uh, those muscular structures of a human body. And you can think about like all of the ligaments and the muscles that go into your leg. And what you always have to explain to newer practitioners is when you're going for a heel hook, you're not necessarily attacking the le- or the, the heel, you're attacking the knee. And, like, most people don't get that. And so something that stuck out with me with Joey yesterday was he was like, don't wait till you feel pain. Like, you have to tap right away because you're not going to feel pain until you feel pain. And, I mean, Brent does that all the time, too, where he talks about, like, you can't wait until you feel it. Like, this is going to attack all of the ligaments in your knee and it's going to snap and pop your knee out of place. Like, mm-hmm. it's not it's not a good feeling. And the problem with it is that when it happens you're out for a while. It's not like Like, this little two-day injury that hurt Like four to nine months. Yeah. So they're very dangerous. And I know Johnny even asked us yesterday when we were walking into the seminar, he's like, why can't white belts do it? Because he's a white belt and he he is fascinated. That's why he was at the seminar. Mm -hmm. And most white belts are fascinated with it. But you're just not allowed to do it in competition except for straight ankles because it's so dangerous and you don't feel it until you feel it. And when you're on this adrenaline high, when you're in competition – your tolerance to pain is even higher than a normal level. And so, I mean, people, that's why people break their arms in competition because they're not just going to tap to give up the submission. It's not training, it's competition. And that's what's happening with a leg is like, they're not going to wait until it hurts to tap. Like, or they're going to wait until it hurts to tap. But then it's too late. Yeah. (laughs) Because your knee has already ripped apart. Right. So it's very important to know the basics of jujitsu with leg locks before you start attacking them and i think that's where the kind of new generation of jujitsu is coming in because leg locks have become such a big deal within the last couple of years Mm -hmm. whereas they were never really anything up until recently yeah the last five years or so Mm -hmm. um because i was even telling my, my dad and i were talking about it last night and i just said i was like i i didn't really realize all of that stuff about positions and leg locks before like you just always you learn a heel hook submission and you learn an ankle lock submission. You don't really learn like the fundamentals of how you're getting in there. You just know how to set it up and then you go for it. Not really why you're going for it. And I thought that that was really cool that Joey was able to break that down. But then even my dad was like me either. He was like, I don't know. Like I learned a lot today. Mm-hmm. Yes. And Joey put it in a really good analogy also saying, if you don't understand the positions of a leg lock, everything looks like leg lock spaghetti. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And it's kind of undefinable what's going on with people's legs. But the main thing that you want to look at in when people are in leg entanglements is, is the leg straight across their body or is it cross the, is it across their body? So it's straight or across leg entanglement. Um, 
and that depends on heel orientation. And then it's where are their feet? Are their feet on the inside of the leg entanglement or are their feet on the outside of the leg entanglement? Mm -hmm. So what that comes out to is you can have a straight leg entanglement with feet on the inside, mm -hmm. so that's one, and feet on the outside, so that's two, or just a straight leg entanglement where its feet are kind of neutral in the middle, so that's three leg positions. If the leg is crossed, you can have the same thing. If the feet are in a regular, if they're not inside or outside, they're just in that straight ashigrami hold, then that's just your cross leg position. Mm -hmm. If your feet are on the outside, that's what you would call a 50-50. And if the feet are on the inside, that's what you would call the saddle honey hole 411. But you can just refer to it as cross inside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he was trying to break it down so that it was much simpler names for us so we could constantly just work on getting through the flow of it, knowing what you're doing. And so he would say, start and straight, and then move into cross, and then move into outside and inside. And like he was just saying it like very, very simplistic terms. Mm -hmm. And I think that seemed to help a lot of people. Because at Fluid especially, we're not a big leg locking school. We don't really teach it very often. We don't really do them very often. We have a couple of people who are interested in them, but they're not like masters at all. So it's right. always cool when we bring someone who does know what they're doing into it. Like we had David Miller come teach every Friday for a month about just leg locks. And mm -hmm. it was a good entryway. I know Charles Harriet, he's a big leg lock person. So I was telling my dad last night, I was like, everything that, that I... Guard when we learned from him. Yeah, I was like, everything I know about leg locks, like literally, besides submissions, is from Charles. And Kyle per Pete Perkins. I don't remember Kyle Perkins. I just know he did Trico Plata. <laughs> he also did a leg lock seminar before that. I don't think I went to that one. I think, yeah. I, I think, think you I... went to the women's one or something. Yeah, I think or I went to... Or you went to lunch or... No, we did that women's forum thing that I couldn't stand. But anyway, it's okay. moving on. <laughs> 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 so... Uh, what was I saying? You're talking about everything you know about leg locks was from Charles. Oh, yeah. So basically, like, leg locks are not a big part of my game. It's not a big part of fluid people's game. So having Joey in there, not only teaching us something that, like, we're not familiar with, but also being able to explain it in a way that makes sense was just, I thought it was pretty special. Yes. And if you don't understand the positions yet, watch leg locks for dummies. Mm -hmm. I think it's highly important, and I'm going to prescribe it to everybody. Yeah. And so one thing that I kind of take away with my training a lot, especially in seminars, like seminars is the number one thing that I think about when I'm, what I'm about to talk about is that I try to take one, if not two things away from every single seminar that I will use for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And so throughout this leg lock seminar, because as I had mentioned, I wasn't like super stoked about it. I was just like, I'm going to go because I'm going to go support at Fluid and be with my, my friends and try to like learn something that I don't know. But it wasn't like... I was excited. I was like, let's go. Let's go do the leg locks. Yeah. So <laughs> I kept telling myself throughout the seminar, I was like, I need to pick one thing that I'm going to retain from this. Like one thing that I want to actually try because it's good for me to work on... It's good for everyone to work on things that you're not good at. And leg locks, I know I'm not good at. So I was like, okay, what's the one thing I'm going to get out of today? And I ended up walking away with three. There's wow. three things that I was just like, okay, yep, that was worth it. <laughs> What's that? So I really, so the biggest thing, the number one thing, and it was one of the first things you talked about was when you are entering the position, just entering, not even starting for anything, just entering in the leg lack position. A lot of people like to go for just one leg. They like to bring both of their hooks in or collapse both of their knees around one leg. Mm. But what I learned is you need to keep your other foot at bay and keep it as a butterfly hook around the other leg so that mm -hmm. they can't keep turning into you. And then you use that knee of the leg that's hooked and collapse, but you're still hooking that other leg because yes. everyone likes to go and hook underneath yeah. the same leg. It's so. almost like you want to control somebody's hips in jiu-jitsu. No way. Is but that like, what you're saying? I realized the first two times that I went through the flow that automatically my brain went to just go attack one okay. leg. And I was like, wow, this is what I've been doing wrong my entire life. Okay, cool. So that was one thing that I got. The second go. thing was I learned how to do an ankle lock so much better. Yes. Like, so much. That was a great guillotine of the sea. <laughs> Stop it. Josh, <laughs> I hate you. He doesn't even remember he said that. I know. So now it's mine. Ugh. But, yeah, so I learned an ankle lock, like, a way to do it and a way to set it up way better. And then the last thing that I got was 
just a positional thing, like just how to, it was the bridge movement of getting it up and over you. Yeah, going from a straight to a cross mm-hmm. leg entanglement. Yeah, and also what reaping really is and isn't. Because yeah. I think our understanding was a little different than what Joey was explaining. Yeah, I had always thought it was over the thigh line, but mm-hmm. he's saying it's over the hip line. Mm-hmm. And it, and he also admitted he doesn't know the rules. <laughs> and that's why he gets in trouble all the time. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, that's one of the things that it's up to the refs who, who you're fighting in front of what they're going to call as reaping. Yeah. But in my opinion, like kind of going back to how I started this was I think that no matter what kind of seminar you're at, or even if it's just a day class or something that you're doing, uh, anytime that you go to training, you should try to pick one thing that you're going to take away that you can use, for, if not for the rest of your life, at least for a little bit to work on. So I think yep. that it, it's more important for seminars, in my opinion, just because you're paying for that hey, seminar. Extra. Yeah, like you're paying for this specialized thing that you want to learn. And so I think it's more important to, like, really have that concept in your brain. But especially, like, in class, too. I'm like, what am I going to learn today? Okay, that's going to help me. And then maybe I work on it for a week, and then I to- I'll totally forget it. Because I'll be like, I don't remember what we did last week. But at least I can, like, now yeah, I don't build- remember Tuesday. Yeah. But then you can start building up that, um, what is it? Like muscle the- memory? Yes, thank you. You can start building up the muscle memory because now you've learned it in class. Maybe you're executing it in your live roles for a little bit. And even if a year from now you can't, like, tell someone exactly what you learned you can at least now just like pull it out of you because there's things that i do in my live rolling that i'm like oh my god that was super cool i don't know what i did <laughs> yeah or if you're alex you end up doing a cayman arm bar right <laughs> right and you just have no idea how you get there but it's your muscle memory from things that you've drilled in the past that are just kind of coming out and that's why live rolling is so important and that's why we stress all the time that you need to roll in order to get better at jujitsu drilling I mean, yeah, you'll improve with drilling too, but it's not going to be anywhere on the exponential rate that it would be for live drilling or live rolling. Some people would uh, disagree with you. Some people would, like exclusively drill. That's crazy to me. Well, obviously they do roll, but they emphasize a lot more on drilling. I mean, drilling is important, but in order to execute it in a live scenario, I mean, people... So the way with drills is that when you're drilling... Your opponent, your okay, your partner is going to be reacting the way that they should be reacting so that you can finish the drill because you're mm-hmm. constantly moving, 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 which is great. It's great for the repetition. It's great for your partner to help you learn that repetition. But when you're live rolling, you don't know how your partner is going to react. They might go the opposite way than you expected. And now you can't finish it because you're not in the right position to do it. Or maybe they defend it in a way that you didn't know how to counter to counter attack like. It's just different when you're live rolling versus drilling. Mm -hmm. So if you disagree with me, I disagree with you. Whoa. (laughs) Because I guarantee you when you're getting attacked on the street, they're not going to defend it the way that your partner in your Oki was drilling it. (laughs) That's totally different than sport (laughs) jiu-jitsu. I guess, but... That has nothing to do with drilling. I think live rolling is very important. There's nobody that is going to attack you on the street and then you're going to transition from a straight leg entanglement to a cross leg entanglement. You might if you're trying to break their leg. You don't need to do either. You can just break break it wherever you want because they have no idea what the hell you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And if you're on the ground, you're going to get scraped up like hell because you're on the concrete doing a leg block. Mm-hmm. Sounds terrible. Yeah. To finish the leg block properly, you want to put your face on the ground. Yeah. But, I mean, that's kind of the thing that we've always talked about, too, is with leg locks, like you had said, why ignore 50% of the body? But a lot of people will argue that if you do leg locks and you're in an MMA fight, you're going to get punched in the face. And that's also different. Yep. I mean, in jiu-jitsu, it's, it's fine because yes. there's no punching in jiu-jitsu. But yep. if you're doing a UFC fight or a pangration or anything else, like, you're going to get hit because you're only attacking their legs from running away. You're not getting their arms together. So it's 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 crazy. a different world. So yeah, there's I like to talk about different veins of jujitsu or different lanes. So there's sport jujitsu, then there's self defense jujitsu, then there's like you know just playing around jujitsu for meditation and hobbyists style of jujitsu, and then there's also jujitsu for MMA, and all of those have different aspects. And the third one I talked about is my favorite one that you just do jujitsu for fun. Bless you. Thank you. <laughs> but um, outside of jujitsu for fun, you have to decide 
what your intention of using jujitsu is for. Is it for self-defense? Okay, you can learn some self-defense stuff and drill it that way. Is it for sport? Yeah, okay. You can not worry about a lot of things that you would have to worry about in self-defense or MMA. And then, is it MMA? This is totally different, and you have to be willing to destroy the other person in MMA when you're fighting somebody. Mm -hmm. And you have to be willing to take some shots while you are actively trying to destroy them. Yeah. It's totally different. It's crazy. I don't understand... So I've never had, like, an urge to go fight in a ring. I know you have it. I know you've done it. But (laughs) I just, I don't understand that urge of, like, wanting to go 100% and try to attack someone. It just doesn't make sense to me. So the reason I like to compete in jujitsu, or the reason I don't actively do it, is because you just want to, like, see where you're at. Like, see your level, see what you need to work on. It's not necessarily winning or losing. It's just where's your game at and how can you improve to be better for the next time. Uh, whereas like, I know MMA is the exact same thing. Like you want to see where your striking's at and everything. I just, I don't have that urge. I don't know what it is. I, it's, I it's just know. the striking part. That's different because mm-hmm. you're taking impact, impact. Yeah. and you have to hit somebody. And when you hit somebody, you have to put everything into it. Yeah. You're like, not just going to be like, uh, like Wesley, <laughs> uh, fall over now. Yeah. Oh, let's clinch. Like Marco yesterday, he was like. Oh, my stomach is like hurting. And I said, Well, you just got punched a lot, bro. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's right. I did just fight. We had a fire last night and it was like 11 o'clock. And Marco was like, I'm so tired. I'm more tired than normal. And I was like, You had a fight. He's like, Oh, yeah, I had a fight today. <laughs> <laughs> He's a funny kid. Yeah. He's a great kid. But yeah, so leg locks, I think, are super important. And I think it's a great idea to duh, think about leg lock as a position and the different ways to move from position to position. And don't think about leg locks as a submission first. Think about it as a position. Mm-hmm. And then understand what submissions are possible. And then what you need to do is figure out how to move between positions and how to set up the entries, to the leg locks, so that you can move between them. And then you become able to integrate your top half game with your bottom half game. Mm-hmm. And then you're completely dangerous everywhere. And then you're a damn problem. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, leg legs, they're definitely important. But as I said, like, just as a newer, I mean, I've only been doing the sport for three years now. So I just feel like, man, three years sounds like a long time, but it's really not in the essence of jujitsu, which is just kind of wild to think about. But. Well, I'm 12, so that's a quarter of my life. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, leg locks, I mean, like I said, I've always just kind of focused on defending them because I do get caught in leg locks quite a bit, actually. Like, I would say, I've always yep. I've always said for the last couple of months, actually, that if I had to put all the ways that I get submitted into a pie that's graph, yep. I would say 50% of it is leg locks. No, probably like 60 or 70% is leg locks, and, and the rest of it is just any everything else, like literally and, any other submission. And that percentage is probably like... Half knee bars, half straight ankle locks, and a couple of heel hooks. Mm-hmm. Some toe holds. Mm-hmm. And I'm not trying to say, like, I don't get submitted. I do. That's what I'm just saying. Like, if I had to tally them all together, let's say I get submitted ten times in a night, probably six of them are leg locks. Yeah, my weakness in my game is kimuras and toe holds. <laughs> yeah. And heel hooks, but I'm working on that. Our white belts are really cranking on these kimuras now. <laughs> I'm noticing because I used to not our get, white belts. Yeah, well, I used to not get uh, kimura very easily because my shoulders been so far back that people would mm. either get grossed out and let go, or I would just defend it to the point where they don't want to do it. But like I've been kimura like four times in the last month because they're just cranking it, and I'm like, you know what? Okay, 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 you can okay. take it. <laughs> yep, tap. I'm done. I'm like this is my fault. I should have should have gotten out of this earlier. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you cannot rely on that. <laughs> Yeah. But in my head, I've always just, like, relied on my shoulder to go back far enough. That's a terrible strategy. <laughs> they let go. That's fucking awful. <laughs> do not do that. <laughs> like, fun tempo. Nick just got me in a really, really nice one this week where he was locking it down. He he's, told me about that also. He's not a white belt. Did he? Oh, you sure. both told me about that, Kimura. <laughs> I heard it from both point of views now, so I can put it together if you guys need some counseling. 
No, it's fine. It was good. It was a great Kimura. He did fantastic. I was just super mad at myself because I defended it for a good 30 seconds, and then I moved, and then he locked it in further, and I was like... And then he said the timer went off right after you tapped. Mm -hmm. That's probably the the saltiest part for you. Yep. 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 Yes. But we were talking about leg locks, so... But leg locks and Kimuras are the same thing, just different parts of your body. (laughs) It's true. You can do a Kimura to somebody's leg, Mm -hmm. and I have done it, and it's, like, very brutal. Mm -hmm. It pops their hip out of their socket. Yep. Anyways, we that's didn't totally do any different. calf slices yesterday, though. That's like way down the line in the positional hierarchy of leg locks. Mm-hmm. But we didn't do any knee bars either. No. Nope. I like knee bars. Well, you should have asked. You can ask them today. Mm-hmm. We can set up a private lesson. We're not doing leg locks today. <laughs> what we're doing? doing? <laughs> what doing? <laughs> we're doing mobility today. Yeah, but then we're gonna roll. Sure. Okay. So, um. But defending leg locks, the first step to defending a leg lock is understanding the position. So if you wanted to defend an Americana, you're not just going to fight the Americana. You're going to fight the position that allows them to get to the Americana. Mm-hmm. And if you can understand the goal of people getting positional dominance in whatever position it might be. So whether we're talking about side control or whether we're talking about a straight leg entanglement. If you understand the goals of the position you're going to be better suited to shut it down or transition yourself out of there or put yourself in a better position that's more advantageous for you. Why do you have that little smile on your face? I'm just, my, I was not listening to a single thing you just said and my brain was so in somewhere else. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Continue. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure what you just said was great. <laughs> My Welcome brain. to married life. <laughs> Cheers to a piece of dinner, Mary. Yes. My brain literally just went everywhere right now. And I was thinking of so many things. I'm sorry. This was you. <laughs> I was talking about defending positions and this was your face. Hmm. Like you had just taken a bite of a pie that you love. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. I'm crying. <laughs> So, yeah, that's how important it is to defend positions. <laughs> uh, yes, but if you want to go over leg positions, I have way better understanding after first watching Leg Locks for Dummies and now putting together a flow drill for it. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, the other part of leg entanglements, the entries is also three-dimensional because you can enter from standing. You can enter from guard, and you can enter from top position. Yeah, that was something that I thought was really cool, because if you think about, like, if someone is standing up in your guard and you're still on your back, like, if you're trying to play around with your legs on their legs, whether you're going for an X or a single leg X or a De La Hiva or anything that you want. So Joey showed that, and then he knocked Nick with his okay, He knocked Nick down, and he got up, and he's like, look where we are. He's like, you're literally doing leg locks while you're on your back, and they're standing up. It's just a different dimension. Mm-hmm. Which was really cool to like put that into perspective, and it's like I knew that, but I really like saw it yesterday. But you didn't identify cool. or label it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Because I knew I've always your heard your awareness has increased. Right, and that actually really explains a lot of why I don't like doing <laughs> daylight heat and stuff like that because I'm like, this is a leg lock. <laughs> oh, that makes sense. You don't like leg entanglements. I don't. Because even yesterday when he was showing the ways to like like when we did that roll like when we had to yes. roll. I was looking super, super carefully at where his legs were going because he had you had to pull that leg out, right, to go on the back. And I couldn't get it until he physically came and did it with me and moved my leg for me. And I was just like, that's what we were doing. Because all that was happening in my brain was you were here, and then when you rolled, you were in a completely different spot, and I have no idea what happened in that transition. It was spaghetti. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was leg spaghetti. The way he described it, which is also something that stuck with me, is... You want control of your opponent's leg. You want control of your opponent's hips, right? That's all jujitsu is, control your opponent's hips. Yep. But the way he said it is he was like, you don't want your legs to be gooey. Yes. And he said it like super nonchalant and it was just a really quick in there, but it was something that stuck with me. I'm like, don't be gooey. <laughs> okay. I will not be gooey. <laughs> Whenever I coach you in a tournament, I'm going to say, don't be gooey. <laughs> and you're going to be like, shit, I'm being gooey. Be gooey again. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, we're gonna. That's gonna be great for the kids, actually. Yeah, well, that's what I tell Wesley. Yeah, because he's like a puddle of pudding. Sometimes <laughs> I tell him that he needs. That's a fun to... phrase, puddle of pudding. 
uh, yeah, I've t- the way I tell it to Wesley, just to get it like kind of more in his brain, like more on his terms, is I say that he can't be a wiggle worm. Yeah. Like, if he's a wiggle worm, then we can't do anything. We can't get any good striking in. We can't do anything. You don't want to be a wiggle worm. I said you want to be a stick. Sticks don't move. <laughs> I love and, the stick position. Yeah, I know. Sam asked me. Sam was like, okay, what is a stick? And I was just like, oh, Justin's oh. been working with Nick. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, she was like, what is it? And I was like, don't worry about it. <laughs> don't worry about it yet. <laughs> you, you, uh. Let's just focus on getting you some stripes. And my dad was right there when she asked me. And he was like, there's a name for everything. Oh. And she's like, but well, what's the stick? And he was like, I don't know. And I was like, oh, it's a really fun position. My dad's like, what is it? I'm like, I'm not telling. <laughs> you just had a black belt ask you about a position. Look at you. <gasps> okay. <laughs> he probably knows it as another term. No. I showed him it once and he was like. Ha, you've heard, you've seen it and you don't remember. <laughs> I've used the stick on Brett, so mm-hmm. that's a testament of how the stick works. I, I use it a lot on Tuesdays Anyways. with the white belt girls. But Running man to stick, turtle stick, hawking yeah. to stick. I would like to go back over that with you eventually, though, just to make sure I'm still doing it right. Cause if, you the know, stick? Yeah. You don't know how to lay it on? <laughs> <laughs> just to make sure I'm not missing anything. I'm, but anyway, like... anyway, moving on. So, I don't even remember what we were talking about. We were talking about not being gooey. Not being gooey. That's right. Don't be gooey with your legs. And don't just be a stick. Yeah. Wesley, I was saying, don't be a wiggle worm. Be a Mm -hmm. stick. But that kind of all goes back to, like, the leg lock and the controls, is that if you are gooey, if you are spaghetti, if you are being a wiggle worm, you're not going to have control. They're just going to be able to pull their leg out, or they're going to be able to roll out of it. Or, or they're, they're going to be able to get to whatever advantageous position they want to get to. Yeah, they can turn their knee to get to the ground, so now you can't do anything. They can tuck their heels, so now you can't go for that. Like, There's a lot of, obviously, good defenses to leg like, locks. But if you have control of the position that you're working on, just like if you have control of that side control to get that Americana, if you have control of that mount to get that mounted triangle, Like you have, you have to have the control of the position before you can work for the submission. And leg locks are no different. But everyone with leg locks, I shouldn't say everyone because that's generalizing, but uh, to generalize, everyone typically just says, like, oh, I'm going to go for the heel hook now. Or, oh, I'm going to go for the straight ankle because here's their foot. When really, like, if you learn how to move the pinky toe first or if you learn how to expose the heel or you learn how to move their foot to where you need to go or you bait them the way that he showed with the other mm-hmm. leg to make them want to turn a certain way. Like, it's when you start learning all those little movements, that's yeah. when it really will be dangerous. That's like when I use an Americana to set up a loop choke from side control. Mm-hmm. That's when I use triangles to set up arm breaks. Exactly. But you understand the position mm-hmm. that you're using to do that. Mm-hmm. But if you didn't understand your guard, you would never be able to use a triangle to set up an arm bar. Mm-hmm. Right. There's levels. So yeah. first is understand the basics. And if you can understand the different types of leg entanglements you're going to be way better off with anything that happens in a leg lock so leg locks aren't just heel hooks they are also toe holds knee bars like you said slicers um, inside heel hooks outside heel hooks there's a, a steamer locks mm-hmm. the sock lock he was talking about and i'm sure there's more oh the, the mikey lock that i do to you and nick all the time that's one where I pin your foot against my head. Mm, yeah, you just did that this morning. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Before I got out of bed, I Mikey locked my wife. Apparently, it is a now Sunday morning routine for us to just to drill wake leg up. locks. Yeah, we've done it two Sundays in a row now. <laughs> we just woke up and started doing jujitsu, and then our dogs joined, and it's really fun. And we're all four of us are just like, <laughs> but yes, yeah. So I would say that overall, we had a very successful week. And even with the stress of a new job, I still had a very fun week of training. I still made time for jujitsu because if jujitsu is what you're passionate about, you will make time for it. And if it's not, you'll make time for it when you want to. Mm -hmm. So I think that it was a very fun and memorable week. And I love our crazy, hectic life that we're living. (laughs) Absolutely. Yes. And yeah, Joey Deal is freaking awesome. If you're in, I think, the Chicago area of Illinois. Go check out his gym. I think yeah. it's called Real Movement or Real MMA, I don't Real know. Movement Facility, something like that. I would just look up his name. I'm sure he would pop up in the yeah because his last name is D I E H L Deal, and so yeah. if you look that up, it'll I'll, it'll I'll put pop him. Up. I'll put his Instagram in the comments of this 
podcast. Yeah. Like I said, I'm He's sad he cool wasn't dude. supposed to be on the he was supposed to be on the podcast today, but he had a couple private lessons this morning, so our only options were to do it at like six AM and we had a late fire last night, so we decided not to. Yeah. And uh the other thing about Joey that's really cool is Joey and I did one round yesterday because we had like ten things going on. Mm-hmm. But he was like he weighs maybe he fights at 125 pounds. So maybe he walks around 130, 140-ish. And he was like a better version of me, just like mopping the floor with me. Yeah, and he was, was the black belt version of how Nick Lee rolls. And it was like so fun to roll. And I can't <laughs> wait for after our mobility seminar in 20 minutes. I <laughs> yeah, can't wait to roll go. with him for a few more rounds. Yeah. And yeah, I might be heading out to his gym. He invited me to come do some MMA sparring. Cool. Which yeah, that's cool. very fun. I think I heard you guys talking about that at Primal yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. And I was like, ooh. <sighs> but with that said, sorry to cut it short, we do have to actually go to his mobility seminar because it starts in about 20 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> We're about 15 minute drives away. So <laughs> we got to go. But yes. I hope you guys liked learning a little bit more of our perspective of leg locks. And obviously, we don't really know much about them. Yes. But... Leg locks don't suck. You just do. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Apparently, I just suck too because I don't know anything about leg locks. But yep. I probably know more than a lot of people now after yesterday. Which you need is to learn cool. better. Yeah. Okay. So. <laughs> Thanks you for need listening. To train more. Stop it. Thanks for listening, guys. Have a great rest of your week. Oh, by the way, we are out of town next week. We're going to be in and a wedding. Yeah, we're at a wedding Saturday night, and then we're driving home on Sunday. So we've talked about doing just going live on Facebook and doing a podcast from the car. If we do that, we will not be on Spotify or any of the other places that you may get your podcast from. It may just be on Facebook. Otherwise, we may do one from our Airbnb throughout the weekend, but. Uh, chances we are, have your grandma on it. No. <laughs> chances are, uh, you prob- if you listen to us on anything besides like Facebook, you probably won't listen to us next week. So yeah. we'll, we will see what happens. Yeah. We'll, we'll keep updates on the page. So. Yeah. All right. Thanks for listening, guys. Have, have a great a week. Have a great week. <laughs>